Hello, I'm Karen Ross and welcome to this interview with Steve Gurney, one of New Zealand's favourite athletes, a multi-sport champion, author, speaker and inventor. I caught up with Steve last month as part of my 90 Day Resilience for Leaders program and talked resilience with him. What it is, how it applies to life and performance and what it takes to win against the odds. Steve speaks very candidly here about some of his biggest adventures and biggest challenges including coming back from the brink of death and uh, losing his home in the Christchurch earthquake in 2011. So he's had just a bit of experience to draw from to talk to us about resilience. Enjoy hearing from someone who knows that resilience really is an inside job. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Steve Gurney. He is an adventurer, an inventor and a motivator. <clears throat> and I think I could probably add that he's a coach and a trainer and various other things. He is a household name in New Zealand, an ex-professional adventure athlete turned professional motivational speaker and trainer. Some of you will know he's won the coast to coast multiple times and if, you, if you're racking your brain now to remember how many times that was, it was nine times. And he's raced mountain bikes for New Zealand at the World Champs twice. He has an engineering degree. He's invented a bike with wings. Uh, in the Borneo jungle um, racing there, he was poisoned by um, bat dung of all things and nearly died. There's a quite a story of that experience in his first book, Lucky Legs. And he fought back from that to win the coast to coast seven more times in a row then. And of what I know of Steve as a friend and a colleague, he is not one to do things by halves. He's somewhat known for his um, nude escapades and uh, including a nudist streak on New Zealand's breakfast TV and um, delightfully waxed his entire body for Dancing with the Stars, which he did very well in. He has been awarded uh, uh, a Mer Merit of New Zealand gong for services to endurance sport. He has um, a world record for crossing the Sahara Desert by wind power. His next mission is another 30 day kite buggying world record up the skeleton coast of Nam Namibia. And uh, he's a published author with two books, Lucky Legs uh, and Eating Dirt, and is just about to launch his third book that's uh, focused on teens. He has trained as a trainer in the field of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and loves inspiring people to greater heights and particularly loves helping both athletes and people in business uh, to make molehills out of mountains. So Steve, good morning to you and welcome. You are now unmuted. <laughs> and um, it's, <laughs> hello there. <laughs> well, it was very hard for me to defend myself whilst I was muted. Um, I, I, I don't run around naked so much. Oh, okay. You might know, but, uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, in my sleep, perhaps. But. <laughs> okay, so we'll, you could, that's fine. Consider that moderated. All good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can we perhaps just start with a, a sort of a broad question, if you like, and can you just tell us a bit about what resilience means to you and perhaps both in sport and in life? Oh, good question. Um, it's like, what's mm. the answer to the meaning of life? Um, <laughs> well, I just I, I guess I want to say that the older mm. I get, the more experience I get with life, with my sport, with um, understanding, I guess, what life's about, is the more I realise that re resilience is an integral part of, of life, that we, you know, we perhaps, perhaps do a bit of it unconsciously, and the older we get, the more, I believe, we become... Well, more enlightened people become conscious and aware that life always deals you unexpected things, mm. and um, and it's the people who, if you look, you know, take a look back, step back and look at people who succeed, what we call succeed in, in life, um, they are the resilient ones, the ones who are able to take these challenges and things that go wrong in their stride, and they've developed resilience at a more conscious level than and uh, we may have in earlier years. So um, well, I guess the, the, 
a, a, a good learning, a good metaphor for me was my adventure racing sport. So adventure racing mm. is um, being out in the wilderness. It's being in amongst the mountains, the rivers, swamps, deserts, all those sorts of things with the aim of being first across the line. Well, most of us want to win it. Uh, not everyone. Some people just want to finish it. But um, mm. whatever your aim is, the aim is to get through these challenges. Um, and that racing has taught me resilience, you know, to get through those challenges that mm. the weather throws at you or getting um, injured or having a bike break or um, a river flooding you can't get across it. And um, you know, unexpected things. You learn this attitude and the attitude is one of being able to adapt and to be able to bounce back from things that go wrong. And it's been a great metaphor for other areas of my life is to understand, well, you just have to go in with an open mind. You can have your overarching goal, but then you need to develop um, not just the attitude, but also some skills to be able to um, consciously bounce back and get back on some sort of direction again. Uh, towards the finish line, whatever that might be, mm. and um, so that's why I think your course you're doing today is superb. It's it's teaching your students um, some skills they can take away to better get enjoyment out of life, to to enjoy life even more than they are already. Mm, mm. And it, so it sounds like one of the things you're saying is uh, when you're going into anything, and particularly for you in your sport, that. Uh, you go in with an intention, you know what you want to have happen and you plan for that, but you're almost on some level ready for anything. Would you say? Yes, I know, and yeah. that's right. So and it was a huge, yeah, that's a good point because that's one of the learnings I've written about in my Lucky Legs book is, um, you know, as a young kid I was read fairy tales and, and those sorts of things about, you know, prince meets princess and lives happily ever after, <laughs> where, where life is supposed to go exactly as you want it. And man, it was like a whack on the side of the head when I suddenly realised, man, that bullshit. Sorry about <laughs> my language, but that you've got to have this attitude of understanding that life never actually goes exactly how you plan it. Mm. Um, and that, if you can turn the coin over and say, well, that's the beauty of life, actually, isn't it wonderful that we have this all this variety coming at us um, mm. that we didn't expect? And so that was a, a major shift for me. And once, the, to be honest, I'm still adapting, still learning. And I think the key to it is. Is, is awareness, and you, you talked about this mm. right at the start of this webinar, is about being conscious, I think it was the word you used, or something like that, um, being present, sorry, um, and, and being present and realising you don't have to run on those automatic um, reactions mm. that we learn as children, um, that if you can be present and then you can be aware and observe what's happening, even if it's observing my own uh, reactions to my bike braking or my own reactions to things going wrong in life. Mm. And say, well, that's interesting, isn't it? How can I do? How can I react better than that? And um, that's the, that's mm. one of the key tenets of of resilience. I think is to be present. Mm, I I agree. I think that awareness is is huge, and it's interesting. You mentioned earlier about um, those who who are successful and who live through challenges well um, are doing it quite consciously. And I it was interesting for me. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Christchurch after the earthquake supporting a, a business down there and the leader of that business who's someone I've actually interviewed um, before, uh, Warren Johnstone, uh, is, an, is what I would call an extremely resilient leader and he, to the point that it's almost unconscious for him, he has um, but there's also this element where he's been very intentional about coping with what's happening and it was very marked when I looked at the people in the business who weren't coping very well. Um, mm. I really saw that difference. Um, and so I wasn't really intending to dive into the Christchurch story so quickly, but perhaps um, now I will gently segue there um, because until a few years ago you lived in Christchurch. Um, were you born and bred there? No, I was no, I was born okay. in the Waikato actually. Oh, okay. Did, school, did all of my schooling in Auckland, and right, then moved okay. to moved to Christchurch. Um, my second year of my degree, I, I matriculated okay. down there when I when I heard about this coast to coast race, which sounded and it is uh, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. But, um, I so, I'd, I'd um so I I did my university studies there and then stayed there because it's such a fantastic place for my sporting oh, mm. uh, activities. Coast to Coast was based out of Christchurch really, I suppose you could say. It finished there anyway. 
and um, it yeah. was, made it easy to train there. So Perfect. Christchurch for mm. a while was ideal, yes. And um, so, yeah, I, I did, I did, um, I did, it did cross my mind in the, the subsequent years when I bought a house there. The house was up on a cliff on a solid piece of rock, and I thought, wow, you know, as the biblical saying says, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man on the sand. So I thought, well, you know, I'll be safe up if there ever is, was an earthquake, and Christchurch won't get an earthquake because Wellington will, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was quite shocked. And um, it did shake my, my very beliefs. It was a huge awakening to realize, hey, how much of our programming, how much of our life is, is based on beliefs that actually don't hold true? They may have held true once upon a time, but because technology's changed or climate's changed or the economy's changed or we've grown up, mm -hmm. uh, those beliefs don't hold true anymore. You know, like my mum said to me once when I was at school and I'd come home last from the school sports days, you know, this is primary school. She said to me, Steve, oh, you're never going to be an athlete. Don't, you know, don't worry. It's all right. Just study hard and make sure you get good results and go to university because that's where you'll make your money. You won't be an athlete for a living. So, you know, that's mm. a belief that was obviously um, exactly wrong. You know, she loved me. She was trying to be loving, but um, mm. lucky I didn't accept that belief as the truth. And and it's it's a huge awakening me from, from the earthquake. It, it's awoken me to realize that you have to periodically examine beliefs that... Um, for things that may be holding you back, things that may be limiting your progress and your potential, because they, things may have moved on since then and those beliefs may not be true. For example, technology is a mm. classic example. You know, um, things we couldn't do 10 years ago are totally we do every day now, you know, with technology. You know, um, Absolutely. we have thought, you know, what, we look at the, the, the role the, the computer plays and, and what we're capable of with it. And um, so that's, sure. yeah, that's yeah. learning from Christchurch. Yes, one of my. And in the earthquakes, I found, I found myself in the neighbor's yard, in the neighbor's garden, with um, naked in the earthquakes. <laughs> oh, here comes this nakedness again, damn it. I did it myself, didn't I? <laughs> um, well, it was 4.40 in the morning, and you know how many people must have found themselves in the street naked after the earthquake? Um, and in fact, Farmers, which is a department store in Christchurch, a big department store, had record sales of pajamas the week following the earthquake. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. It's not just you. <laughs> uh, so there you are. This is the intro to Christchurch. Um, there you go. So so, I, did, I, did, I did lose my house. Yeah. Um, the, second, the second earthquake, it survived the first one, but um, the, the, the cliff collapsed. Mm. The um, house, house started tilting off the edge of the cliff. And, um, so I've, I've moved out of Christchurch, which is part of the story we'll make cover later if needs be. Um, uh, and I bought a house in Queenstown now, but um, uh, I, I had three years in Christchurch living in a caravan waiting to sort out all the insurance mm. stuff around the house. And I, at first, I, I watched in amazement um, at the Christchurch, has Christchurch re recovered or rebuilt or bounced back or not? And I learned an awful lot about resilience by living in the community of Christchurch and noticing how different people responded and you know I have a neighbor on each side each responded differently one uh, went into PTSD and stayed there mm -hmm. um, and others bounced back and and um, and found the, the the earthquake an enlightening experience and you know we had everyone in, the, in our street had to use the the, the portaloos which have been part of the industry because all you know every mm -hmm. electricity all the services have been smashed and it was uh, every morning standing in the queue for the loo uh, it was fantastic talking to people and seeing their different responses and their growth or not from the earthquake. And so I ended up writing um, a, a few chapters in my uh, second book, Eating Dirt, about resilience. And I, well, that's subsequent to doing a whole lot of research into it with people like Martin Seligman and, and, uh, and Victor Frankl and those sorts of guys. Um, mm. You know, what can we learn from those people who have, uh, those experts, I suppose, and how can we apply that to resilience in our lives? So um, the earthquake was a fantastic uh, teaching ground for me. Mm, absolutely. So how did how did the tool I, I was kind of curious about how your tools and mental strategies that you'd been using in your sporting life helped you in that situation yes yeah, so it's a good question so it's a big uh, big answer which I'll just I'll just mm. summarize briefly and you can go into whatever bits you like so first of all it's that attitude we opened with well I opened my mm. conversation with before is about an understanding that first of all understanding life does present you challenges and if you can in, in the history and study I've done, you know, from my sport too, um, well, let me start again. From my sport, I learned that the people who win these adventure races I'm talking about, and these adventure races I'm talking about are not the coast-to-coast -coast type ones necessarily, but more 
referring to the adventure races that are a week long. So we're out there for usually seven to ten days. There's a bunch wow. of four people side by side. Um, very little sleep. We get about an hour's sleep a day on average, and we're battling to win. You know, um, and I choose that word battling carefully. <laughs> it's actually um, it's the attitude you take. You know, is it mm. is it a ballot, ba battle? Is it a challenge? Is it is it a, is it a problem or is it a hurdle? You know, and you see the difference. And this is what NLP is largely about: the linguistics is mm. understanding our word choices have different meanings or different feelings attached to them, and so. This is the attitude. The first step to to resilience, I believe, is is seeing it as an opportunity or as a as an obstacle, um, and uh, uh, and and then from there you, you have a totally set of different set of resources available mentally, and 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 it totally affects your state of mind, which is uh, that determines the results you get. So um, that's I think that sort of summarises in a nutshell. That's one of the things I learned. Um, when it comes to Crises, rather than just you know you mountain bike um, getting a puncture or something. When it comes to a crisis like the earthquake, I found it was necessary to remove myself from the zone, if you like, that's causing the damage. Like in an earthquake, um, very immediately, um, there's a possibility of aftershocks and the building collapse. And so, mm. removing yourself from the, the danger zone is getting out of the building into a into a safe space. But then later on, months and years later. I found I needed to remove myself from the city sometimes just to get out of the brokenness. The streets were still sure. broken, the um, services mm. are still broken, my house wasn't repaired and it was just getting too much. Everywhere I looked there was brokenness and it was important to recharge, to get into a, a resourceful state. I needed to remove myself from that and go somewhere beautiful like nature, go up to Arthur's Pass or go and visit friends out of town or go on a holiday overseas or something for a week um, just to, to, to get yourself back into a better resourceful state to be able to um, cope with the challenges again. Mm. And then there's a whole lot of habits, you know, I learned uh, from the earthquake, which uh, are, you know, things like getting enough sleep and good nutrition and exercise, stuff like that. On a racing level, um, that, that, that could be equivalent to managing your resources, like you're getting sleep um, enough to be able to finish the race and to be able to manage your um, food intake and, um, and, and checking your gears in, the, in good condition, that sort of stuff. Mm. That that makes sense because we and we talk about this on the on this program quite a bit is the um, the necessity for just having the real basics in place around food nutrition just enough that the body can function well. Yes, I'm just going to shift myself out of this noisy room. Sorry, there's a sure thing. Machine going. I'm listening still. Yep. Yeah, so uh, it sounds like even when you're um, out in the middle of nowhere, um, that those key things like having enough, just an, it sounds like just enough, but enough sleep, the right kind of fuel, the right kind of hydration, so that your body's going to be still functioning effectively is pretty key. It is, um, yeah. and, and that's... Um, Kind of when you look back on it, that's kind of common sense, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I think it is. Car, some people do, don't they? Yeah. Drive the car when it's the, tank, the tank of gas is empty. Yeah, and I, I <laughs> when you, think when you, when you think about it, you need to make sure you've got what you need. Yep. Yeah, 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 and I because I talk about this with business people a lot because um, I think we tend to forget that okay, we're. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Sure, right. Thank you. Right. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. So I might just move on to another question, and that's a bit connected to where we started around resilience. Um, it's one from one of our team, actually. So when when did you need your resilience most, and how did you employ it? Ah, good point. Um, so there's been probably three occasions. Um, first of all is... Um, my, I had a professional career for 20 years as, a, um, as an athlete and my sole job was to um, obviously enjoy it, but my, 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 in, on a functional basis my sole job was to uh, win races and that is when I employed resilience extremely, um, well I employed it a lot at a high level and um, to the point I was getting weekly coaching sometimes in the field of NLP just to make sure I'm on track. Um, and it's something I used every day, every time I, every, every time I went training, every time I was getting prepared for training, and it's certainly within the race um, to a high level. 
um, I used all the resilient skills I could in terms of uh, dealing with um, the challenges that were ahead of me. How? Uh, that's, that's, mm. So that's the main one, but of course I used it also uh, recovering from the earthquake and I had mm. um, part way through my career also had uh, uh, leptospirosis, uh, you know, major blood poisoning um, mm. that uh, threatened to kill me and um, certainly all the experts said I should stop my sports. So I, I used you know, a lot of NLP resilience skills there in terms of getting back into my career again. But I think the main one really would have to be on a daily basis when I was professional sport in my professional sport. So can you tell us a bit about how you discovered NLP? Like how did how did that happen? That because you'd been um, competing for a while without those skills. Yes, um, I I um, it was actually people assume I won coast to coast pretty easily, but it was actually my fifth attempt before I won it. Mm. Um, and uh, it was those first two or three years where I um, got close, but not good enough. You know, I wasn't getting my, I wasn't getting the wins, and things weren't going so well. And I got to a stage as a professional where you, you know I can't keep this up. Either I have to give up my professional career and, and try find something else, or make some major changes that enable me to, me to win. And so that's when someone suggested I go and see Brian Lloyd in uh, NLP consultant in Christchurch at the time, and um, I never looked back at it, it was fantastic, it was, and it was so, NLP was so useful um, in my career that I promised I'd, I'd learn to I'd do more training once I've, I've finished my, my sport, so um, yeah, that's what I've done. Great, Cause, and you talk about it in your, in Lucky Legs, um, and some of the strategies, and, and some of those strategies are all uh, the ones that we uh, utilise in this program um, and I'm kind of curious about your take on our internal state. I know um, John Overdurf who's a very renowned international NLP trainer is a big advocate of how pivotal a resourceful state is for performance and personal effectiveness and I think it's huge. That's been my experience personally and with a lot of clients. What role do you think our state, our internal state, plays in performance, whether it's in sport or at work or wherever? Yeah, it's funny. Eh? As a as as a young, um, I was almost an arrogant upstart. You know, um, I probably was arrogant actually. <laughs> um, when I was, when I was a, a young professional, you know, some people say there's a fine line between being driven and goal oriented, and being interpreted as arrogant. But I probably did step over the line. Um, the older I get, uh, the more I realise, you know, as this young young buck, you just go and bullet a china shop, wanting to just win, you know, and you throw your full energy at it. Um, and the, but the older you get, the more I realise it's about state of mind. It's about um, you've heard quality versus quantity. Um, mm -hmm. I had quantity in those days, just training like crazy, overtraining, in fact, to the point where I was um, stale, you know, mentally stale. Uh, it's called overtraining and mm. uh, or burnout. And but nowadays, you know, I'm a I'm a sprightly 52, <laughs> and I can still beat a lot of young bucks just by being cunning and clever. And part of the being cunning and clever is choosing or, or purposefully creating your state of mind to be in a resourceful state where you're releasing the right chemicals, the right biochemicals to to, to be able to perform fantastically. And um, and it's about knowing, you know, that. That state of mind is about having the presence and the calmness to know when you can push the accelerator to the floor and when you need to hold back a bit because your body's not quite ready for it or whatever, and and, mm. and, and thereby win the race by um, by being clever and and that's all about state. It's all about being in the right state of mind. And so uh, you know, I might have gone from as a youth uh, young fellow thinking. Um, Racing was sort of ninety percent physical and ten percent mental. Now I've actually reversed that. I'd say it's more like I'd say it's pretty accurately a ninety percent mental, you know, state of mind and ten percent physical. Obviously, you have to have a base fitness to be able to win races, but um, that that top mm. level stuff is all about state of mind. And you see it time and time again in sport. Um, for example, rugby. You know, the, the, someone who's got to convert a penalty. Mm. And, um, you see those goal kickers, they carefully line the ball up and then they 
do their little mantra. They go through their little routine. Mm. You know, they step up beside it and they take one step sideways and three and a half backwards and then they hold their little talisman around their neck and they you know, <laughs> bend their arms and then they stand three times on the left foot and five times on the right. They're getting themselves in the right state of mind yeah. and they kick the ball over the, over the goalpost, you know? Mm. And and you see it not just, you don't see it, and it's not just rugby. You look in most sports, you'll see, you know, track and field athletes doing it the same, you know? Um, the way that the sprinters set up in their steps and all those things. It's just all about state. Um, so important. I think that's a great example too because what's so interesting when you see someone, uh, see a rugby player converting that try, is there's often quite an effortlessness to the kick. You know, they'll, they'll do their run up, they'll swing their leg through, but there's this, there's not, it doesn't look effortful to me often. And I think, yes, yes, yeah, exactly. the same with the, even the high jumps, you know, that's a classic mm. one to me, you guys are jumping such an amazing height, and it does look like they're just flowing, it's awesome. Mm. I think, um, in fact, I was just writing about this last week, that I think many of us are addicted to hard, that we think mm. we have to, um, what I uh, call, slog your guts out to make things happen, and what I'm hearing from you is, there's a lot of wisdom in and yeah, making state the most important thing and being wise about what effort you do expend and that it's in all the right places at all the right times. <laughs> yes. Well, here's, here's another, it answers your question about um, how to discover NLP. Well, um, here's another story which uh, um, kind of illustrates how I discovered by accident. Well, it was, it was more that I was a, an arrogant young fella as I said in those days, I wasn't really open to other possibilities. And um, early coast to coast days, um, I'd, I'd, I'd had a bit of burnout after many races, and I thought, no, nah, I don't want to do the coast to coast this year. It was the most important race of my calendar, but I knew I wasn't really in the right state to enjoy it and win it. Um, so I said, look, how about I just be film crew? I'm fit enough to be able to keep up with the league guys for a little while at least. Why don't I carry a camera? You know, one of these GoPro type things. Got it. On the, on the bike and the run and the kayak and um, so the film crew spent hours setting up all the cameras on my gear and on the kayak deck so it filmed forwards and backwards and and um, now the organizer said and the TV producer said look Steve we want you to do a bit of training um, so you can keep up with these guys as long as you can we want to no one's ever been able to film the front bunch from inside the race so we want you to do it be the first so I was pretty excited by that you know and I thought right I'll do a bit of training and so anyway, long story short, I kept up with the guys for much longer than I thought. Got to the end of the mountain run, and I was still there with the lead bunch, and I couldn't believe it. I had camera in hand. I was asking <laughs> them questions along the way, um, filming them from behind and backwards, and um, it was in, in front. And um, and I got to the end of the run, which is traditionally the most challenging part of the race for me. Um, and from there on, it was you know I enjoyed the kayak very much, and so my light bulb went on and said, I, I said, should I do the race? So I abandoned the cameras. Because um, as part of this, I had to have a race bib on, so I'd actually officially entered. So I've been in the cameras, told the crew to um, radio ahead and take the camera off my kayak because it's a bit heavy, and I won the race, you know? And <laughs> this is, this is illustrated for me. I love it. <laughs> the state of mind is about being relaxed and enjoying it and effortless. Mm. You know, as you say, it's about, it's about how do you make it so it's effortless? What, so you can ask the question backwards. If I was to have fun and it seemed to take very little effort and look so easy... What sort of state of mind and what sort of physiology would I need for that for that to be able to happen? And that's another way of looking at it, another perspective to take to get clues on how you need to be. Yes. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great example. Um, I'm going to just check in with the group in a sec and see if there are any questions. I've got one more for you while I do that. Um, You've had numerous experiences of what I would call winning against the odds. What's been a highlight for you? Uh, oh, oh um, good question. Good question. Um, oh, yeah, okay, I've got a good one. Um, mm. After, um, it was 10 years into my 20-year career, I got that leptospirosis I mentioned. Mm. It, um, it was, I caught it as a disease... Um, it's a blood poisoning virus type thing um, that are caught in the cave, uh, caves of the Mulu caves in, in Borneo. So we've been doing one of the adventure races. Um, the last day, the seventh day, we'd been 
racing through the caves, the Muna Caves, and unbeknownst to us, I was kind of naive, um, didn't realise you'd catch a disease from all the bats in there, mm. um, a disease called necrosclose. I had a cut on my leg, and it seems like that's likely where it got in. We won the race, I need to point out, so our team won. It was a few <laughs> days later, before I managed to get back to New Zealand, um, I came down sick over there and ended up in a hospital in Malaysia, then in Singapore, on um, life support machines, kidney failure, lung failure, unconscious, in a coma. Mm. And, you know, they said I was going to die. I called my dad. He came over and said goodbye to me. And, and it takes more than that to kill a gurney. <laughs> so, I, I didn't die, but I, what, what doctors and, and nephrologists had told me, they said, look, Steve, you've had kidney failure pretty pretty hard for a, uh, for your kidneys now um, and or the racing you do with dehydration, you know, your kidneys mm. may struggle that we advise you give up your sport, give up your racing and be normal, you know. So um, that was like a, a red rag at a bull, you know, and I said, um, I was, you know, I was very upset about that and um, I, 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 that, winning against those odds, to come back and get into my sport, uh, against those odds mm. was probably my biggest challenge. And I really had to examine things. I had to go back to basics and ask, you know, what is important in life? And it's a bit like the bucket list movie, if you've ever seen that. You know, it's about thinking, what what would I regret if I didn't do it? You know, what sort of things would there be? And getting back and giving my sport another nudge was, was right, for, for me, my state of mind at that time in life was very important to me. So I... Um, um, yeah, I, up until then I'd had 10 attempts at coast to coast and only won two. And then I decided to go back to sport and the doctor said, look, you know, if, if you really must, then at least give it two years of looking after yourself before you go back to competing. And then if you still must, then, then you can go back. And so I, after two years, I, I went back and I won seven in a row. So it was, I was far more purposeful wow. and passionate than beforehand. And, um, and so... I, I often have to ask myself, what were the, what was it that I that I did in my head? What sort of things did I do that enabled me to be more successful than before? And um, that's the highlight, I guess, is I'm, I had really had to line up, you know, line my ducks up in a row totally and get everything right for me to make a comeback to a sport again like that against the odds. Mm. And, and a large part of that um, was being in the right state. You know, the, the right state is as a in a, in a um, meta sense there, or you know, overview sense, is that I had to balance that anxiety and drivenness and, and and purposefulness I had about wanting to get back to my sport. I had to balance that with also not overdoing it, you know, being in the right relaxed state of mind and making mm. it easy. Um, so, um, and I guess another way of saying that might be useful here for your, your uh, students is that um, this, you know, if you want to categorize, you could, put, you could have two descriptions of motivation. One is away from mm. motivation, which is an example of that. I didn't want to finish my sporting career with any regrets. You know, and away from motivation, right. other examples are you know, you're not allowed mm. out to play until you've tidied your room. You know, you pay your taxes on time or you pay penalties. Um, so it's motivating you um, away from bad consequences. Um, but also, I also had to mix that with toward motivation, which was setting you know, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goals like winning more coast to coast, you know. So mix toward and away from motivation together, and that was, I guess, another an way of putting my, about, about my state of mind um, after that leptospirosis. Mm, awesome. It also sounds like you had a renewed, um, like a really powerful, strong purpose around doing that, and I just wonder how much you think that, because I think our why is massive, and in terms of motivating us and helping us, you know, achieve and live a full life. And I wonder how different that might have been for you than a lot of the other competitors and whether you think that that kind of passion and purpose may have given you quite a competitive advantage in the end. I think it's a very good point you make, Karen. Yeah, I agree. The why in life, it seems to me, uh, from my perspective, it seems for humans, uh, we need to have a why. You know, we need mm. to, you know, you look through the history of humankind, no matter what, whether it's Mother Teresa or whether it's um, a billionaire. You know, that we all need to, we all have a goal of improving our lives, um, making our lives better than it was if they were yesterday or last week or the year before. Mm. Uh, whether it be improving, our, you know, to do with, whether it's to do with values or whether it's to do with um, money or whether it's to do with purpose, uh, you know, or achieving things, taking things off. 
and I, I think that if you, the stronger you can connect with your why, your values, then um, the more successful you tend to be. Mm. And I, I think it definitely was a, a key there. And it's interesting now that I've got to the stage of finishing my sport. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I no longer compete uh, at a professional level. Mm. Um, I have to reevaluate what is my why in life, and mm. sometimes it's not easy. <laughs> it's yeah. quite challenging even now. But fortunately, I've got this example of a, a phase of my life where I did have a very clear why. You know, I wanted to be New Zealand's best at, my, at adventure sport, and mm. that was very, very e easy uh, for me to line things up and 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 make decisions on things, whether it's helping me for my, in the direction of my why or not. And so now I have to go through that again with a different uh, yeah. phase of my life is, you know, what is my why and, and how can I get there mm. more easily with, and have more fun doing so. Great, yes, and I think um, it's a really good point that we, sometimes that does need refocusing, our values change, our purpose moulds and evolves as we evolve. Mm. So, well, and, and circumstances change, life changes around you as well. Yes, true. You know, like I've got to the end of that phase, so my why and things do change because I'm no longer capable of winning those races anymore. I have to think of something else to do or find or identify something else that's important for me to do. Yeah, great. So, Steve, can we just, do you mind if I take a minute to see what questions we might have from the group? Thank you. So, I'm just going to see. Okay. Okay, so we've got an interesting question here from um, Richard. So he's asking, you've comp competed against a lot of possibly more naturally gifted athletes or fitter or whatever. Whom of those could have won more would you say and I don't know that you want to name names but what have you noticed about who could have won more if they had studied resilience and mindset as part of their strategy because like, <laughs> good, good I think yes, when you know what you know especially from NLP you can often see on the from the outside what's you know possibly yes yes yes, yeah. yes good question I often breathe a sigh of relief and think phew um, lucky NLP is a small field that no one's discovered much yet. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the competitive advantage. Because <laughs> I have the advantage. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, the more I live with NLP and find life is so much more uh, rewarding and satisfying, um, the more you want to spread the message with the world anyway. So um, what a wonderful place it would be if, if everyone knew about how to use our minds on purpose. Um, so... Um, you know, through NLP, you know, so there, there are lots and lots of people who could have beaten me. Yes, um, there's um, well, probably three or four athletes I can name off the top of my head that are absolutely, definitely more physically skilled than me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a naturally talented athlete. I have lots of endurance and lots of determination and and uh, and purpose, as you figured out. That's probably what gets my, me my wins rather than physical prowess. So, um, mm. and along that purpose and determination, that you know, those skills that I've learned through the field of NLP and resilience. So, uh, I guess that answers your question. But yes, you know, I, I'd say that anyone who really, really wants to can, if they really want to. Mm. Mm. And I think Richard's just added a piece to his question about, um, you know, who beat themselves. I guess, and I think yeah. that speaks a lot to, you know, I'm often working with business owners and it's about getting you out of your own way. Yes, um, that's so true. And, yeah, I, perhaps you've noticed that with athletes too where they're kind of getting in their own way in a way. I think um, absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, you know, nowadays I'm on the other side of the camera lens. You know, when I'm, when I'm at Coast to Coast, I'm not lining up ready to race. I'm lining up on the other side of the line with a camera crew interviewing athletes. And so I often get to meet, um, as I go along the start line, I get to shake hands and meet the top contenders, mm. you know, the favourites for the race. And I can usually tell by just having a few, quick few words in, in a matter of seconds with each athlete and looking in their eyes, mm. um, I can tell who's going to win. 
and it's the one who you know the ones who have that relaxed confidence about themselves. And where does that confidence come from? Yes, some would say that you know some of us are it's something we learn as kids whether we're confident or not, confident or not. Or, but a lot of that confidence now comes from what we're learning on this course. Is, mm -hmm. um, the tools we learn about how to prepare for a race and plan for a race and get in the right state of mind. And as an athlete, you know when you're in the right state. It's this nice, fine balance between a little bit of nerves. You need a few nerves. But it's also about knowing that you've done everything you can to prepare. Like, um, I, Here's a real example for me. is um, One of the things in, in a big race like the Coast to Coast is um, there's nervousness about gear failure or, or, or something happening that I wasn't prepared for. Um, and this this ties in beautifully with resilience, by the way. So what I do, what I do typically when I enter the race, when I send off my chief months beforehand, I start a list, uh, a list mm -hmm. of all the things that could possibly go wrong in the race. Like, for example, putting a hole in my kayak, um, uh, losing a shoe in one of the transition bags, and you know, my support crew accidentally drops it, or uh, the, the support car running out of petrol, or um, my bike breaking down. I mean, there's there's pages and pages of things that could go wrong. Yeah. Now that sounds really negative, but it gives me a chance then to prepare against um, against that happening. And there's two there's two types of, of of preparedness here. One is a cure, and one is a prevention. And the cure is like a, you know the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. A prevention is the fence at the top of the cliff. So obviously prevention is it's much more powerful. Um, and so I go through and list off all the ways I can prevent those things happening, and um, and prepare and plan for that. You know, for example, putting a hole in my bike. Uh, a cure would be a, a repair kit with duct tape in it, but by then it's too late. You know, the, the kayak is damaged, it's filled up with water, I had to call, call on the side of the river, empty it out, uh, wait till the hull dries, patch it up and then get back in the race again. I've lost half an hour, I've lost the race. Prevention is much better, where I'll um, buy a Kevlar kayak, which is more resilient to knocks and bangs, plus, more importantly, I'll train on harder rivers, I'll get better skills, so that the river on the race day is an easy one compared to my skills. Right. So, um, mm. so when you go to that level of planning and preparedness, that's part of resilience, you see. It's planning ahead and getting in the right state of mind so that I can, on the start line, have great confidence and I can be more relaxed because I know I've done everything. I've thought of everything, I've planned for everything, and that puts me in the right, rela right relaxed state and confident state to be able to uh, be in the, in the box seat to ready to pounce and win, win the race. Yeah. And, that's, and what, that's what those guys have done, you know, the people I see right. whose eyes I look in. Right, and I think what stood out for me when I've heard you talk about this before is that the other thing that you're that's happening when you're on the start line then is that you're not then worrying about what might go wrong, which for a lot of people is their kind of default thinking, because you've done what you can and then your attention is really on what you want to have happen on your outcome. Is that a fair comment? That's right, exactly right. Well, another way of putting that, Karen, is mm. um, you've identified what things you have control over and what things you don't have control over. And you, and the things you do have control over, like that, that list of possibles, yeah. you've done everything you can to prepare. And it gives you, it's exactly right, it frees your mind up now to put it on where you do want it. You know, then mm. you close where attention goes. And yeah, absolutely. Then you close where attention goes. If you're focusing on things that could go wrong, I mean, what sort of state of mind is that? But instead, you yeah. want to be free to be able to focus on, on how you want life to be. Mm. Great. We've got one more question and we're kind of um, stealing time now. Um, so let's wrap up with this one. So um, James is just asking, other than when you were very ill, have you had a time where you um, bottomed out, so to speak? And what made you flick the switch and how did you adapt to embrace flicking of the switch, so to speak? Other than when I was really bottomed out, yeah. So um, you understand. So was that James or? Yeah, I, I guess that so sounds. James, James, James's understanding. He must have read my book or understood that I've been through a very, very bad state of depression in the past when I, you know, had, had that leptospirosis, and once again when I uh, had to retire from my sport um, due to injury. So uh, to answer that, uh, you know, I think that he said other than when I was bottomed out, I think. Going back to when I was bottomed out, it's a very important part of it. Is having been there in a bad place, mm. I I don't want to ever go back there again. You know, it was it was valuable. It was worthwhile going there and learning, getting the learning from it. So I wouldn't sort of miss it. 
I don't really want to go back there again if I can help it. And that's what NLP is about, is learning other ways of thinking about things so you don't have to go back to relive old times again. Mm. So that's understanding that, you know, been there, done that, tick it off, I don't want to go there again, so what's a better way of doing it? And uh, and that's uh, that's what helps me flick the switch is um, is just a knowledge, just not reliving it. It's a knowledge that that was a really dumb place to be. Oh, not dumb. It was it was it was a unfun. Really, uh, <laughs> it was an unfun place to be. Right? <laughs> exactly. It was. Yeah. Um, I I, I, bet, I I know there's better things to spend my valuable moments of my life doing mm. and having more fun. And so um, that, that makes me flick the switch. It's an away from motivation. I don't mm. want to go there again. So um, mm. instead focus on the toward motivation. What do I want? And that flicks the switch and say, right, I do all those things you've learned about, Steve. You know, um, get outside in the sun, take a break and have some healthy food and, and change your state of mind by taking on physiology of how would a, sta- uh, a happy person, how would your role model stand and act and behave and talk? And what sort of language makes you uh, get in a better state of mind? So go and mm. do those things that you know that you know work. Mm, great. And that echoes a lot of what we are playing with on this program. So that's um, great uh, confirmation of some of these strategies. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I think we'd better wrap it up for time, but thank you so much. It has been brilliant. And I feel like there is so much gold in amongst what you've shared. There's just oodles for people to take away and uh, contemplate and apply. So th- Thank you very much and um, all the best for your next chapter and your new why and all that jazz. Thank you. It was fun. I really enjoyed this. Great. (laughs) Cool. So go well. Feel free to sign out. We're going to wrap up our session and, yeah, thanks again. Have fun, all of you. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Bye. Bye.